In April, we're going to hear from, hear about here a, a social view of Socotra from a researcher Natasha Slack Balak, uh, who has worked there and edited a uh, edited a volume uh, by a number of other uh, authors. Uh, this uh, follows on with our with our several Socotra trips. Uh, in May, we're going to hear from Professor Lloyd Weeks, who is an archaeologist uh, focused on resource use by ancient people, and he's going to talk to us about research use uh, here in the UAE. He's, uh, he uh, includes uh, chemical work, and he can tell you about sources of copper and iron and so on, and he'll tell us uh, about some of that in the, uh, in the Emirates. Uh, field, trips, uh, uh, field trips have been uh, suffered a little bit recently, partly due to the weather, partly due to people's uh, schedule. Uh, we have uh, coming up the next one that I see now is uh, actually a substitute trip uh, to museums and to Sharjah museums. And that's going to uh, be this time we're going to the Islamic Museum, the Heritage Museum, and the Archaeological Museum. Uh, so there's it happened, been. It happened, it happened, happened, it happened, happened already. 18, yes. Uh, uh, why do I have this on Sunday, 18 February? Because you were going to give us this talk. That can't have been Sunday the 18th. This is the 18th. Right? 19th. Okay. That happened already. Okay. Coming up, coming up then, we're going to try and fill in the last weekend in February, but it's not uh, uh, filled. There's a Socotra trip going out. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, copper smelting trip was one of those canceled. March, we've got Towers of Russell Kema. Uh, an archaeological trip uh, and the second uh, weekend in March. The ninth is a visit to the Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, touring the Louvre exhibition, but also highlights of the uh, architecture of the, uh, the building. International trips uh, are going out most of our ways off. In uh, 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 April, there's two trips, one to the Peloponnesus in Greece, the other is to the hill country of uh, Nepal, uh, spending time at a rural uh, school uh, there, as well as uh, a tour of uh, Kathmandu. And in the pipeline, we have archeological trips, uh, Dalma Island. Uh, I'll be doing a, a, a nature walk and we're looking at uh, several uh, other venues uh, uh, Wadi Waraya and several marine oriented trips, uh, SeaWorld, Atlantis, and one of the turtle rehabilitation projects. Um, to those of you who've renewed your uh, memberships for the year, thank you. Uh, to others who think we're, we're worth supporting, uh, uh, please uh, consider we're still uh, one of the uh, UAE's best bargains at uh, 50 dirhams for a year membership. Uh, our lectures are open to the general public. Uh, uh, that's whether you want to listen in at home or whether you want to uh, visit us here. Uh, but please consider helping to support us because we do pay for the hall and the equipment and uh, the uh, 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 Zoom uh, uh, connections and so forth uh, for, each, uh, for each lecture. Uh, Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce a speaker that we haven't heard from uh, before. And I, I think he doesn't have, have a long career as a, as a public speaker. Uh, he was introduced uh, by our Gazelle editor, uh, Heidi Stroitzma, which is a reminder to me to remind you uh, that if you know of people who you think might make interesting speakers, uh, don't keep it to yourself. We'd love to. We'd love to hear about it and have a chance to present them. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Ahmed a week or so uh, ago and wished I had done so uh, uh, sooner. Uh, he's. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I, I won't give away his age. He's not very old, but he's not. He's not very young either. Uh, and he uh, he grew up with a uh, like many of us, I guess, with a love for nature. And he's pursued it here in the Emirates, not in a not in a, a formal academic way, but in a very scientific way. Because I learned that he goes around not just photographing things, but he watches them over time and and uh, looks at what they do. 
uh, he, for example, followed the snails in his uh, in his garden and watched a bunch of snails come in slowly and the population grew and then all of a sudden declined and he found that they were that they were being uh, uh, parasitized by some kind of uh, fly and wound up leaving maggots in each of the snails. Sorry if I'm turning off anybody in the, the home audience with this. Hope you're not watching over dinner. Uh, the uh, uh, That kind of thing can get you into trouble and uh, uh, I learned at lunch that one time when he was uh, we was out in uh, Mushroom Park with uh, uh, with uh, Heidi uh, showing the kinds of things that he did. He said, "Well, well, let's let's look under this piece of wood or something." And he was going to look for I've forgotten whether it was a centipede or something. And unfortunately, it was something with a couple of fangs uh, that is, was potentially potentially deadly, small but uh, but deadly. But he knew enough to be careful and. Uh, Heidi, I suppose, takes this kind of thing in her stride. Anyway, uh, he'll have, I'm sure, many, many additional uh, instances, both from wild UAE and also uh, Ahmed uh, can take us behind the scenes in some cases, behind the garden walls and the palace walls, because he'll have, I think, some, uh, some presentations of exotic plants and maybe some exotic animals uh, that can be found in Dubai that we don't usually see. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to uh, Ahmed al Mansuri. Thank you, Mr. Gary, for your uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank you all here for coming and thank you, Heidi Stroxma, for uh, inviting me to give this uh, lecture. And uh, Allah, my name is Ahmed al Mansuri. I'm an Emirati national from, uh, from Dubai. Uh, so growing up, this was my hobby. It's not a job or a profession or any of that. Uh, so, so today I'll be talking about the plants, both native and non-native, and how they are, uh, uh, and what they contribute to the both the environment and the uh, the wildlife. So today, the context will be about my background. I'll be introducing, introducing uh, myself and the environmental challenges in, re in relation to plants. The natives versus non-natives. Oh boy, the environmentalists will hate me. And invasive fauna and flora. And some of my observations. And last, inshallah, we'll have uh, the Q&A session. So my background. So this whole thing started with uh, this mess that you see in front of you. It start, uh, started off with uh, my hobby of raising animals, mostly birds. I just want to get this off my chest. That bird over there, the yellow crested cockatoo, it's a pain in the neck. Just let you know. Uh, because I don't trim my birds, I just let them fly. I don't trim their wings, uh, their wing feathers. So I just let them fly every once in a while. And they just, that one in particular, enjoys removing the fronds of the dead palms. That's chaotic. The, the guy underneath, the, uh, the gala cockatoo, he is as polite as he looks and he's helping me with the weeds. So growing up, so growing up, all I know about, about animals is where they come from. They just come from pet stores. I have no details about their life in, uh, in the wild, in, the, in, the, in their natural habitats. So when they went on a trip with my grandmother to India, I don't remember what I think it was a medical trip or something for her. Oh, that's better, thank you. Uh, so I told her I wanted to buy a CD for one of the video games that I had. She said, there's a game store downstairs. We'll go and pick up your uh, your, uh, your game. So I was excited. So we went there. It was not a game store. It was just like a stationery with Barbie dolls and teddy bears and uh, pencils and pens. And the back, there was a book about birds. About now. So I just I told my grandma I want to take this book. I was so embarrassed to tell her that, no, I don't want this. I want my video game. So when I took that book, it was about birds, but about wild ones. And it included the parrots and included the chickens as well, but not their domestic form, but their natural, but their uh, ancestral form. It was called the red jungle fowl and still exists until today. So it just opened my eyes, but how do these things live in the wild? I mean, I don't have to feed them. I don't have to give them water. They have to face predators almost every day. So how do they survive? So that just opened my view, like I have to know how these things live in the wild. So 
And I have noticed this very strange and complex, well, a very strong and complicated relationship that connected the animals with the plants. And it's so strong that if you remove the plants from, the, from that certain environment, the animals disappear with it as well. So that was what introduced me to the world of plants to begin with. So I take this photo in Bujir and sorry in uh, well I forget I forget in Khorfakan. It was after the rainy season of 2019 and early 2020. So the environmental challenges in relation to plants is the high summer temperatures, 50 degrees Celsius is not uh, it's not fun. The long dry period, the poor soil, the saline uh, soil and water. The salt laden wind, it's the salt that it's the strong wind that blows the coast areas. It just takes the salt and just uh, scatters, scatters it over the, the landscape. That itself is uh, detrimental if your plants do not tolerate salt. And then you have the simum wind. The simum wind, so it's called simum in Arabic, is the wind that blows in the dry interior. It just, it's just hot and it's dry and it's just. Simum. We say simum in Arabic, but the English name is also simum. And that's what I found uh, on the net. So all of these together are all have one present one challenge, which is the availability of water. The higher the temperature, the more water the plants need. Of course, dry period you need water. The poor soil and well, it, the water does help with poor soil, but that's almost indirectly. And of course, the wind and the salts. Uh, the water helps with that a lot because the wind just blows, uh, the, uh, evaporates the water of the plants uh, from the plant's leaves. So you need shade and windbreak. That's number one. So windbreak is the trees that you plant that uh, that blocks the, the wind and reduces the speed. And that reduces, of course, the evaporation. Trees, like in, the, like in those pictures, uh, and that picture is the uh, Zagaf tree. Those trees have like a like a layer of uh, of wax, a very thin layer of wax on the leaves that actually reduces and traps the water in the leaf, and protects the more sensitive plants. So, if you plant the gal trees, you can plant behind them trees that are uh, sensitive. Say, for example, like your mango trees, for example. So, although all trees can cast shade, not all trees are suitable to be used as windbreakers. Have you tried to use cherry blossoms as windbreaks in the UAE? I don't recommend that. Large stuff trees that are tolerant of heat and strong wind are the best choices, preferably evergreen and fast growing. Well, the fast growing part is a bonus, but if they are evergreen like the half trees, because it's the leaves that help to make the, to create that buffer for the uh, to slow down the wind. So underneath are the examples of the tree, the gray mesquite, the half tree. It's called gray mesquite because it's a mesquite tree. Cineraria in the Latin name is the means gray. Lance leaf buttonwood, the red gum, the apple pine tree, and the thorn mimosa. These are their, their pictures. So these trees, what, what they all have in common is that they make good choices due to their fast growth, their low maintenance, and the tolerance of strong wind. So each and every single tree can have the good and the bad side. The timbers are they're fast growing, their tolerance of the heat and the droughts. But the problem is that they just collect the, uh, the salts from the surface of that, uh, from the soil, and they just scatter the, the salt. And so we can see the grass just drying, it's just dying under the, uh, the, uh, the tamarisk. The, the eucalyptus are fast growing as well. They're highly allopathic. Then you have the acacia, they grow fast, even though they're native, but the problem is that they are reliant on irrigation once you start irrigating them. And then you have the lance leaf buttonwood tree, which is a mystery tree because nobody knows do we list this tree as native or not. Because these trees are, they're native to southwest of the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen and southwest of Saudi Arabia. Other part of uh, reducing the, uh, the moisture loss is the application of mulch. So mulch first retains the soil moisture. It just reduces the amount that evaporates because the sun no longer has direct, uh, does not hit the soil itself directly. And of course, that mulch, it can be made of, it can consist of hay or leaves or uh, wood chips. They just break down over time. That increases fertility, provides habitat for microorganisms, shelter for some beneficial insects. Uh, each of those leaves, if you remove uh, any of those large leaves at the corner there, you can see, each almost, almost each and every single one of them will have like a jumping spider or a millipede or a wolf spider under, under them. 
and it's a suitable habitat for fungi and regulates soil temperature. In Europe, they have this habit of putting mulch under the trees before it gets cold. Uh, it confused me, like they don't have shortage of rain in Europe, why do you have mulch? Turns out that the mulch actually helps reduce the, uh, the, the impact that frost can have on the roots of the plants. The, the body of the plant can get hit by that frost. It's okay, they can survive that as long as the roots remain protected. Before you ask any question, I don't know what these mushrooms are. I don't know if they are edible. I have not tried them. I have no idea. So the first sign that these the soil is improving is the emergence of mushrooms. Mushrooms in the garden are a good sign, but they indicate that the soil is healthy. But to promote, but to uh, uh, to support their uh, their mycelium to colonize the ground, you need to protect them from the direct sunlight by using mulch. You avoid tilting and plowing the soil because again, the mycelium is like the root of the plant. And so it's like the root of the mushroom. It's very thin white hair. If you constantly tilt, this, uh, tilt the soil and uh, plow, you just disrupt that, uh, uh, the, the, the plow of the, uh, the mycelium. And of course you avoid using fungicides they, because when people, because we associate fungi with root rots, uh, sooty mold, gray mold, we're, Crown rot, heart rot, it's a lot of diseases that plants get from fungi. So people use fungicides uh, to kill those diseases, but they don't know that at the same time they're killing, they're killing the, benef the beneficial ones as well. So you would, why do you care about fungi? Uh, because it helps plants absorb water and nutrients from the soil more efficiently. The mycelium of the, of the mushrooms will actually collect the nutrients and the water from the nearby sources. And it will take those nutrients all the way to the root of the tree or of the plant. And it helps plants resist diseases. Some mushroom, some fungi will release some sort of toxins into the ground to suppress the other harmful ones from taking over. And it raises the plant's ability to tolerate drought. Well, if the mycelium knows, has access to some uh, water source, it will just bring it all the way to the plants, to the, to the roots of the plants, because there's an example of Europe where uh, the mycelium, just one mushroom can spread for for kilometers, and uh, they encourage the roots to uh, the encourage roots because again the mycelium of the of the uh, of the mushroom acts like a corridor. The roots will follow that the roots of the plants, and some fungi control pests. One good example of those are the the cordyceps mushrooms. You know the mushrooms that turn ants into zombies. So there are many types of uh, mushrooms. Some effects moths, uh, beetles, and so on and so forth. Some nurseries will actually send you, will sell you pellets or tablets that consist the spore of the mushroom. The spore is what you call the seed of the uh, of the mushroom. You see, these are called the gills. In them, you will find the spores, billions of them. So how do you know that? Uh, so this is how, well, this is, well, it's not a soil. This is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catastrophe. <laughs> That's how the soil used to look like in the past. But after the constant application of mulch, this is what happens. This is how it looks like. So what does this mean? It means that fertility is increased. There is the soil holds more moisture now. These white lines you see over here, these are actually roots of the plants that are growing nearby. These are actually the roots. And the salinity decreases because in areas that are uh, that have frequent rain, it just stops the minerals from uh, from uh, from concentrating at the at the surface. So the so the pressure so the presence of moisture actually as either slows down or stops the uh, the the minerals from uh, uh, concentrating. Okay, natives versus non-natives. That's that's a self from flower for my garden. The most suitable plants to grow in any area are those that are native, as they are the most adapted to grow there and are more tolerant of the environmental conditions. Uh, However, diversifying plants, plant life, and planting plants that are able to withstand the environmental conditions is something I would personally recommend. Almost every year, new plants enter the UAE, and those plants are grown for many different reasons, such as ornamental purposes, fruits, medicinal properties, shade, honey production, soil rehabilitation, etc. People are, are moving to planting the honey locust in the UAE now. I don't know how that's going for honey production. So if you are from Europe, you're familiar with this tree, the weeping willow. It is hands down my, or among my favorite uh, temperate climate tree, the weeping willow. Uh, 
I've, took, I've taken this picture in Slovakia, I think back in 2015 or 2016. Uh, so weeping willows are grown for their beautiful pendulous branches. Pendulous branches are the branches that are uh, that are droopy, basically. But the problem with uh, weeping willows is that they are water thirsty. They have very aggressive root system. I learned that the hard way. And they're prone to scorching when exposed to harsh sunlight in the summer months. You see these yellow lines over here? These are the, the main branch. The main the branch actually is exposed. The back of that branch is exposed to the sun. Here in the UAE, this, if this part is exposed to the sun in the, in the summer, it just completely dies, dies back. If the tree is completely uh, visible or exposed to the sun, it just dies back. On the other hand, you have this tree. The gal tree have similar appearance when matured. They are drought tolerant. They don't have, well, the roots are aggressive, but not as the weeping willow. They have less aggressive root system. And they're taller to the sun exposure. So that's so that's a very good alternative to grow instead of a weeping willow. I agree, but although it hurts my heart to say it, but yes, the half tree can take the place of the weeping willow. But does it apply to every na non-native plant that we grow here, such as, for example, mango tree? The answer is no. So one example, a realistic one. This is a tree that's very, very commonly seen in the gardens here in the UB, the neem tree. They are common in gardens. And they have many, many uses that collectively, all of these uses put together, you will not find one native plant that has all of these together. They are highly medicinal. I think it has, uh... oh, sorry. Uh, so they are highly medicinal. They have, I think there is 180 different types of diseases that you can use the neem tree as a cure for. They are called pests. They are one of the main things that they are used, uh, uh, they're used for, especially in India. They have noticed that during low rates is that the more neem trees you have in that area, the less your the less damage your your crops are the less damaged your crops are from the locusts or the grasshopper rates. And they're used as natural insecticide. The the the, uh, the seeds of the neem tree is pressed, and the oil that is extracted is mixed with water and sprayed. Uh, it is reported to have effects against two hundred different types of pests: aphids, mealybugs, even the weevil there, the palm weevil, etc. Uh, you can even use it indoors if you don't have a garden. Yeah, it's, they work well against cockroaches, even bed bugs, against all of those things. Controls nematodes. Nematodes are small microscopic worms. They are the worst thing that you can have if you have a tomato plantation. The neem tree allows the nematodes to infest their own roots. Once they are infested to a certain degree, they will just release this, uh, this chemical that will just kill the nematodes in mass. It will actually help other plants that are sensitive to nematodes to grow in, around them. Uh, soil pH neutralizing properties in the leaves. Uh, we know the soil pH, the neutral level is, uh, is seven. If you go above that, it's alkaline, and below that is, uh, is acidic. The UAE, since it is it's dry, so we are, to, we are more toward the alkaline part, eight or nine. Uh, the, the leaves of the neem tree, reduces those, but never makes your soil acidic. Although we wish, but it, it cannot make your, uh, your soil acidic. It just brings it more to the neutral side, 7.5, 7.2. And if you live in a place, uh, they sell some products for someone who has a garden in Europe near pine forests, because pine increase the acidity of that area. So they apply uh, like the, the leaves of the linden tree or the linden tree, just to increase that, uh, uh, the alkalinity of that soil. Neem trees will bring it more to the neutral side. They don't make it alkaline and they don't make it neutral. So, uh, sorry, they'll make it uh, acidic. And they're well known for reducing soil salinity. I have not understood the science behind it because if they, what I heard that they absorb, uh, and I read as well, that they absorb salts. If we compare that to the mangroves or the silvery orange, or the, uh, the tamarisk, that is that they take the, soil, the salt from the soil, yes, but then they have to get rid of it. They, they concentrate the salt in the leaves and they drop the leaves or they just release the, the salt from the leaves. So I think it's just the, uh, the fact that they, uh, uh, they neutralize the soil uh, pH. So diversifying plant life. So if, so if you look at this picture over here, this is actually in a, in a public park, as you can tell in Dubai. So why is diversifying plant life is so crucial? In my opinion, because it ensures the availability of food for wildlife throughout uh, the year, especially for pollinators. 
different plants, oh, you know that the different plants will flower and different plants will fruit in different times of the year. Uh, the last uh, Gazelle magazine, it, it, it was the sad part that they had that millions of bees, honeybees die in the summer because there is not enough pollen, which is actually sad because they rely on the cedar tree, this is a versus spina cristi, and acacia tortillas or bachelia tortillas for honey. Other plants to them doesn't matter. Uh, so their bees will starve in the, uh, in the summer because nothing really flower much in August and June, or uh, sorry, in August and July. Even the rot trees will stop, I think they stop flowering by mid-June. Plants come in many different shapes and sizes, thus creating the suitable habitat for wildlife. Some, some birds would prefer this kind of habitat, as you can see here, with all these dense trees, the Indian roller, the shikra, it's a type of uh, bird of prey. They prefer this kind of heavily wooded areas. Other birds, like the hoopo, like the uh, hood hood we got in Arabic, it prefers this open kind of landscape. And the reeds uh, is favored for the, uh, it's favored by the, the graceful perennial. Prevent diseases from spreading. Not a lot of people know this, but for example, this is a casuarina tree. There's another casuarina on this, uh, on this, uh, on this side as well. If this disease is contagious from this casuarina to another, these trees over here act as like a barrier because once disease tries to spread and gets this kind of obstruction, it does not spread further. It just stops here. Uh, unless this disease can be transferred uh, through birds or through, uh, for example, unsanitized uh, 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 pruners. This reduces the chances of outbreak of pests because different plants will attract different, uh, different birds and different insects. And why does, why does it uh, prevent the outbreak in the first place? It's because there's not a lot of resource. For example, like the weevil cannot have uh, access to, the, to, to dead plants that are growing in, uh, amongst other plants. Because it just, insects are, just, are, not just, are not like birds, are not like us. They can just look at the plants and know, oh, there's a, pale, a dead plant. So I just have to go around this ponciana and get to it. It's just more confusing for, for the weevil. So it just, just confuses that pest. And some pests will actually, because they have sensitive uh, smell, they can get distracted by the different smells that different plants emit. And while the plants are just, the insects are confused, they are constantly being exposed. Then they get picked up, they get picked up by the, uh, by the predators, especially, especially the Indian roller. It's one of the, the main predators that I know that hunts the, uh, the weevils. And of course, different plants will have different air profile qualities. The rock tree is a very, uh, it's a very effective tree. This is research, Egyptian, uh, Egyptian research. His name is uh, Dr. Ashraf. He actually found that rock trees are very, very uh, effective at removing carbon monoxide from the atmosphere. So these are just examples. So the drumstick tree is favorite sort of nectar for the purple sunbird. This is the Moringa, also called the Moringa tree over here. This is the purple sunbird. This is a male changing to, the, uh, to its breeding plumage. Uh, if you want to find a place where you can find sunbirds, the best place to look for is the, the neighborhood that have a lot of moringa plantations. In the season, you're almost guaranteed to find them. The lantana is attracted to the skipper butterfly and other species of butterflies. These, these, uh, these butterflies, the skipper butterflies, are not, they're not rare. It's just they are not commonly found outside the, the wadis and the mountains. So finding them in Dubai in a public park is really is, is a treat. And other butterflies, well, they love this, uh, they love this flower. The crimson speckled moth uses the salt heliotrope as a larval food for caterpillars. This plant is common in gardens. We do have native uh, heliotrope, but it's not grown in gardens. It has very, can I say spiky or very prickly leaves. These are grown for, uh, as a ground cover. Because these caterpillars don't do much damage, it's not, at least not visible. So they're allowed to go uh, and unsprayed. So the chestberry tree has the longest flowering periods of, any, of almost any plant in the UAE. Uh, uh, when I told you about the, the fact that they die in the summer, the honeybees, because those honey, just because honey, honey keepers do not keep the other plants in mind. If this plant flowers, because the matured specimens can flower each and every single day of the year uh, in a heavy way as well. And it's, it's even native, I think it's native to south, uh, well, the, the European part of the Mediterranean and can live for months without even any irrigation, which is unique actually. 
And this picture actually is the uh, is a type of leaf cutter bee, mega chili. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Maxillosa. So just remember, just uh, keep this uh, this picture in your mind. You're gonna need, need it. we're gonna come back to it. Urban plantations provide a safe haven for wildlife in many cases. Uh, the removal of plants, whether native or not, can negatively affect wildlife in many, as many organisms will depend on these plants for uh, as, as food for, and shelter. In, in cities where these kinds of plantations are rare, they are usually the only place for birds and lizards and oh, snakes, but uh, nobody can notice them in this part, so they're, they're safe. But in this public park, I have noticed that this area has been sealed off. So the way, which park is this? This, well, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> so they have so they have put a barrier around this uh, these reeds now. I think I, I hope I'm wrong. I'm wrong a lot of times, but I hope I'm wrong at this time that they will not remove them. But I have seen some portion already removed. And these birds, all of these are found in that uh, in that area. The picture of the, of the reeds in the last slide was taken in, in a public park. That area has numerous type of birds nesting and feeding on the reed seeds. The graceful prinia nests there and as well as the silver bill. Well, this guy is not native, but it's adorable. Nobody cares, look at it. <laughs> so this tree, the Royal Ponciana, I got a lot of arguments from, from environmentalists. It's, it's useless, it's only flowers, it doesn't do much. Not only is it more beautiful than a milkweed, but it also is, although it's uh, grown for its flamboyant for, uh, the blooms, the Ponciana is attractive to honeybees, carpenter bees, and others. I also noticed small insects. I could not get a good uh, look at them. They're very small. They look like wasps, but I couldn't tell what they are. In the season, you can find them. They're very fast flying from one flower to another. And there as well, I have no ex explanation for this, but birds like to nest in them. And I appreciate the fact that this is not my royal Ponciana, that parakeet is eating. But this is a juvenile parakeet. They tend to eat the, uh, uh, the buds of the Royal Ponciana. And the invasive species. Uh, I choose this because I like that invasive plant, so I chose a nice photo for it. This is the mesquite, the Mexican thorn mesquite is one of the names it's given, Prosopis juliflora. But due to the harsh environment of the, of the Arabian Peninsula, very few plants can establish themselves. The mesquite would be among the very few examples. Other, other example would be Acacia farnesiana or Bacillia farnesiana. It's not very, like I will not find, I don't, I don't expect to find it in the desert, but they are more common in wadis. Other examples of invasive plants are restricted by some factors such as the presence of, uh, of water near dams. Uh, when I met Mr. Gary around a week and a half ago, uh, he raised this, uh, this point that near dams, sometimes there will be leaks. That presence of water allows a certain plant called the Rowillia, Rowillia simplex. Uh, to grow. It's not a swamp, it's, it preferred the swampy kind of habitat, but it's very easy to control. All you have to do just seal that crack and it's, it's gone. So we'll elaborate a little more on the, on the mesquites. Why is it so problematic? It grows fast, it spreads very quickly. Uh, like the, the germination rate is so, so high of this plant. It's highly allelopathic. Allelopathic plant is a plant that puts uh, biochemicals in the ground to suppress the growth of other plants nearby intentionally is a form of competition. This kind of branching, although birds like this kind of, uh, uh, this kind, this kind of trees, but it just limits the amount of water, uh, sorry, the amount of uh, light that, that hits the ground, and that reduces the likelihood of any seed germinating. Plus, the allelopathic crop just makes this plant a very uh, difficult plant to deal with. The, why are they so pro, they're proliferating? They are over, because, of, because of overgrazing, because they tend to be, uh, if, they are, if there are heavy metals on the ground, toxins, they just take all these to toxins and, they, uh, and they concentrate them at the tips of their, of their branches. That makes them not, a tr not something that camels would like to, to graze. Uh, the lack of competition from healthy native trees high seed germination, and their strong allelopathic properties. So in the picture on the right is a heavily coppiced god tree. This practice is done by, uh, by, the, by you know, the owners of camels and goats. They would cut the god trees in that method, and they would, supply, and they would give it as fodder for, uh, for goats and camels. 
You see the ground underneath the, the, this lot trees is completely expo exposed. So if there was any camel or goat in the vicinity that ate the seeds of or the fruits of the mesquite and came to eat whatever, whatever little bit of foliage remained, this is enough to stress this plant beyond, uh, beyond its capacity. If this plant is growing in a garden, it can't tolerate this kind of abuse every other year. The ones in the wild will, will perish if you do it, if you repeat this practice three times or two. Uh, so this picture is the half tree. A healthy mature half tree like this specimen in the picture can cast enough shade to suppress the growth of the mesquite. There is no way I have never observed a mesquite growing under the shade of a mature half tree like this. No way, I've never seen it. It can sprout in this area right here. It can sprout here, never under that half tree. Absolutely never. You can find examples uh, of the opposite happening, where the, you can find a, a very large mesquite growing, and then you'll find the half trees sprouting just underneath. Because they are both mesquite trees, there is some sort of uh, tolerance of their allopathic properties. If, if I give, I told uh, Mr. Gary about it, the, the reason why the the half tree chance may not sprout under uh, the, the mesquite. This is not enough sunlight, and animals and their chances are there are no seeds under the mesquite to begin with. If animals have access to that shade of the mesquite, but because of the way they grow, gazelles and camels have no access to the shade of their canopy. If the half tree go, if somehow the seed is there and it's viable and it's healthy, it can sprout under a half tree, under the mesquite, but it will grow as a single branch going upwards, conserving all of that energy to grow uh, as a single branch. Once it penetrates the, the canopy of the, of the mesquite and spreads, the mesquite, the part that is shaded by the rafshu will die, and only the part that's in the sun will, will continue to grow. But if but if the rafshu grows to this size, the mesquite is dead. It, there's no way it will live. The Arabic name for the, the, the mesquite is Rawir, which means little raf, because it's, it looks like the rafshu, but it's a smaller. So yeah, it's, won't be, it's not a bad idea to just say about the benefits that this tree has, due to, but they have a, they, by nature, the mesquite is a heavy flowering plant. They produce high uh, pollen and, uh, uh, and nectar as well. <clears throat> Honeybees and leafcutter bees and carpenter bees, like now will be a good time to visit the mesquite and you will find all the diversity of, uh, of bees on the mesquite. That's, it's something to consider because when you cut down this tree, you just uh, deprive all of those plants from uh, those honey, those bees of nectar and uh, pollen. The legumes are utilized as a source of food for some wildlife. We'll see examples now. And the aggressive branching habit of the, of the tree makes it a popular choice for nesting. It's useful for soil rehabilitation. I'm not saying you should plant it, illegal to plant it, please. I did not say plant it. It's effective at removing heavy metals from the soil. It's called phytoremediation. It's the same way they use sunflowers to remove uh, nuclear radiation in Japan and for and uh, Fukushima and sorry, in uh, and Chernobyl in, uh, I think it was in Russia, I believe? Ukraine. Yeah, Ukraine. yeah Chernobyl in Ukraine. Uh, sunflowers, actually, it's, there's a theory saying, saying yeah, it's, it's a theory that says that these plants confuse these heavy metals and the radiation for, uh, for nutrients because they just happen to be heavy feeders. And this, and this is type of uh, parrots that have naturalized in some parts of, the, some parts of Dubai. When they eat the, the legumes of the mesquite in that stage, the seeds never sprout. They're just destroyed. And basically now it's about the animals. Of course, it's it doesn't you don't need to be a genius to know that most of these animals that you have here that are invasive are uh, uh, were actually pets and they were actually released or escaped captivity. And the absence of predators help these animals to reproduce and grow in numbers, impacting natural resources and at times devastating crops. The only thing people care about is impact is uh, you know, devastation of crops. So, so why is this? So why is it, so why is this thing considered the uh, bad? Well, it's the pest of some fruits such as dates, tamarind, jujube, and of course mangoes. So uh, people have every right to be mad, and they feed on the eggs and chicks of birds. I have not seen this. I've been observing them for a number of years now. I've never seen it, but I never say it never happens, and. Supposedly, the absence of predators support the population growth. Uh, in wooded areas where the five 
well, the palm squirrel is present. They are preferred by the predatory birds such as the shikra, the little banded goshawks, uh, accipiter bed is the, uh, the Latin name. These squirrels are normally favored as prey items over birds. So in this picture is a, a juvenile shikra attempting to catch that squirrel. Well, should I say I'm happy that it failed, but I don't know, I'm so confused. It's a failed attempt, but if this makes you feel, if you, it makes you feel better. There's an adult shikra with a, with a squirrel. I think it's a female. That's a successful catch. Uh, in areas where uh, these squirrels are present, the bees would prefer to hunt the squirrels and leave the birds alone for the time being. So another very, very uh, difficult pest to, to get rid of is called the peach fruit fly, Petrosa zonata. It says to be native to South Asia and Southeast Asia. It came through infested fruits that came from, uh, from the vegetable markets. And they are very destructive of almost every fruit I can think of in the UAE, excluding dates and I believe, yeah, dates, that's it. So <laughs> the spider on the, on the bottom is called Pain imperialis, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, when the cedar tree, Arabian jujube, the uh, Zephyr spina Christi, when, it's in, when it is in, uh, in fruit, uh, you find these spiders actually on that tree specifically just to hunt that, uh, that fly. So when the cedar, because we do plant them for their fruits, when you spray these pesticides, you do kill these spiders. And over time, they, these pests just get uh, more immunity and the spiders just, and for some reason, they don't get that uh, immunity like they, they do. And crab spiders, like the one at the top over there, they just sit on the flowers waiting for them to come. Well, yes, they hunt bees as well and other insects, but these peach fruit mice feed on nectar as well. So when they come to attack that uh, that crab, uh, so when they come to drink that nectar, the, the, the crab spider attacks them. Uh, but in 2019, I have noticed that wasp over there, on the, well, on the right, uh, parasitizing the eggs or the larvae of the wasp, of the, of, the, of, the, of the fruit fly. You can see that she's depositing the egg inside. This is an infested fruit of the cedar tree. The, in, in Arabic, we call it nebj. If it is Phopius arisanus, like this Latin name over here, uh, this species will put their eggs in the egg of the lar of the of the peach fruit fly. The larva will hatch as normal. It will eat and it will devastate the fruit. But at the same time, the the wasps young are just eating it from the inside. You yeah, don't imagine it. And there's also another wasp. It can be Phopius arisanus or this. What's, what is the scale that that's a wasp small enough to be parasit parasitizing the egg of the fruit fly? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very, very small. Very, very. Extremely small. I use a macro lens to take this picture. And there's another type of wasp. It could be Perpius orisanus, or it can be this name, which I don't know how to, I won't even try to pronounce it. <laughs> it looks very similar. When I, when I uh, researching these parasites I was, I'm confused, like either this one or this one. The starlings, uh, my second favorite group of birds here. Uh, well, not only they have nice hairstyle, but they, the starlings in the UE, they were all originated as uh, cage birds. Uh, the Asian pied starling, especially, is known for their beautiful, uh, beautiful, uh, you call them warbles, warbles, you call them? They have very beautiful uh, voices. Yeah, warb yeah. The common mina actually. The common mina is just like that hill mina. It, they are also able to copy uh, human speech and they're very resilient. And of course they escaped captivity or released. With the apparent lack of predators, their population grow, uh, competing with native birds over food and nesting sites. I could not, I do not have examples of common minas competing with native birds. I have seen them though trying to take the nests of the house sparrow, which is non-native, passer domesticus. Uh, but I'm not saying that it cannot have any competition, but it's just that I have not seen it. I've been watching, well, I have raised some myself, but uh, I've never seen them uh, attacking the nests of other birds. An omnivorous diet, berries, insects, small vertebrates, lizards, and they're very, the, especially the common mine is no pushover. I have never seen a bird that's able to, to bully these guys. These guys are more shy. Like you can just, Approach them, they just fly away. These guys don't. 
I have been actually been attacked by one. There was one that had nestling that fell from the nest in my garden. So I was just walking behind, I was trying to catch it, to put it back, and I just left it alone. They're, they're actually, it actually hurts their, their pecs more than you can actually imagine. So if they have, so if we have the shikra, if it attacks the, uh, the squirrel, I found this picture. Can it possibly attack the starlings? In this picture, I could not identify what that prey item is, but when I show the, the uh, some people the the uh, especially my my friends who are wildlife photographers, they say that it might be well, given the plumage and the color of the legs, they're yellow. It can either be the common miner or a uh, a juvenile uh, Asian pie starling, because there is because I think that picture of the shikra in my garden it was it was around sunset. That's why the picture is so unclear. I, mean, I apologize for that. But there is a nest of the common miners uh, in the vicinity, so it might have been their uh, their offspring, but I'm not sure. But as you can see, it has yellow legs and uh, there's the plumage. And doves, of course, everybody's complaining about, Heidi complains a lot about the pigeons where she stays. <laughs> so for a very long time, they have been raised, of course, for their eggs and, uh, and their meat and become popular pets, especially these guys, the palm doves and the uh, the Eurasian color. I only know one person who had, I don't know why, had these the wood pigeons as, uh, as pets in his aviary. Uh, no, yeah, so yeah, these guys, when I ask around if they're native or not, one guy, me and Heidi knows, uh, he said that they have been present since the 70s, around 1976, I, I believe, that he have seen them in the UE. And they were restricted to a certain area. So the shikra is a known predator of doves with cats in urban landscapes. So this is a picture of a juvenile shikra with the Eurasian colored dove, uh, the one at the top right. So this is a juvenile. And I just happened to be driving that area and just saw it and just took a photo. And I'm, I'm sorry I disturbed it, but it, it flew away with the kill anyways. So other than this shikra, other uh, predator of these doves is the, uh, is the Western Marsh Harrier. It's a migratory bird that comes here in the winter. So predators. So that's the the shrike. That's the marsh, uh, the western marsh area, and that's the Indian roller. Of course, we all know that when you remove predators from a certain ecosystem, you just send the whole ecosystem to a spiral of. Uh, I don't know what's the word to choose. Yeah. Uh, the, so I have seen. Uh, uh, I have seen the shikra, the marsh area. Snakes and yes, I have almost been killed by a viper that day. At a certain place, I lifted a log. I was I was looking for centipedes actually, and I was surprised by not one but two vipers under that one log. So you're talking to a survivor. <laughs> and the Arabian red foxes. There is that one area that I uh, that I go to. It's in a, it's in a neighborhood, but it's close to a desert. And that in the sandy area in the desert, I find minor parts. Pigeon parts scattered in the uh, in that area, so it may be there the Arab red foxes. Though someone did tell me that yes, they do hunt pigeons. I don't know how they do it, but apparently they do. And wasps. Well, the people don't like wasps, but they. But yeah, they help you a lot with the certain pests like caterpillars and a lot of those things. Uh, these are the main predators that I have. Uh, uh, the snakes, by the way, the I think it's called the four scale uh, sand snake, four scale sand snake. It's one of my friends, uh, he's a wildlife photographer, has actually photographed one attacking the bulbuls on a half tree. So these, so these are some of my observations, like why am I not calling for the complete eradication of these? Some of the non-native birds uh, disperse the, the seeds of these plants, such as the, the we, call them, we call it Arak in Arabic, Salvadora persica, common minus and the white-eared bulbuls, they are uh, very effective, uh, dispersers of those seeds. Uh, the parakeet, this is on my tree. It's, it's not my bird, but it's, it's my tree. This, uh, sometimes the, this parakeet will just eat the fruit on that tree, but sometimes they will just pick the fruit and fly to, uh, to, to the neighbor's garden or anywhere and eat that seed. And that's how parrots actually disperse seeds in the wild. They just pick the fruit and eat it somewhere else and just drop the seed. And also another reason is because we've come so far with these birds that the, the non-natives one. If you kill the common miners, if, if you want to, uh, by all means, do so, if you have the permit. 
But as their Latin name suggests, Acridotherus tristis, it literally means grasshopper hunter. I have seen them hunting grasshoppers, locusts, caterpillars, roaches, and, and others. It reduces my need, at least for pesticides, uh, especially for caterpillars. And also, a lot, uh, when, you, when you expand the green landscape, the, the green spaces, kind of, let's say, you do have people complaining about the red, about the Arabian paper wasp. I, I have no problems with these guys. Uh, but because, of, because if they're growing in number, they become very available for other birds. But I have noticed that the white-eared bulbul, the one you see right here, have apparently seemed to learn. By the way, I take this picture of the same tree on the same day, of this the same uh, of, of these these birds. I take their photos at the same uh, at the same time. Apparently, the bulbul in this one area. I've only noticed this in one area where they actually take or catch an Arabian paper wasp, and they will actually try to break the stinger. I think, and suddenly they do it just like the uh, uh, what do you call it, the the bee eater where they hit them on the on the tree. And eat them. I've only noticed this behavior in that, in that one area only. I have not seen it anywhere else yet. Uh, in areas where the moringa oleifera and moringa peregrina, which is a native one, are present, cross pollination occurs, resulting in a hybrid tree. Would this be good or bad? I, I, I personally have no opinion. The, the hybrid tree maintains the leaves of the of the moringa, which is this one, but maintain and maintains its branching habits. But the bark and the flower resemble that of the peregrina. So this is the native one. And this is what the hybrid looks like. They do cross-pollinate, apparently they do hybridize. I thought that their, that their seeds are, uh, are sterile. They, they do not re uh, reproduce through seeds. Because I tried to plant their seed, they didn't sprout. But one guy actually told me that they, they do uh, sprout from seeds. And that's my Instagram account over there. And that's the link to my book. I'm an author of the book called Al Bastana fi Jazirat Al Arab. It means botany in the Arabian in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it's in, the book is currently in Arabic. Inshallah, uh, we'll be working on the English uh, translation. So I've chosen this photo because it raises a lot of questions. So if you guys have questions, please go ahead. So. That was fascinating, and I'm sitting here thinking, all of these animals that many of us see all the time, and we don't focus on them as much because they're not native and wild, and yet it's life going on all around us. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. I don't want to be the first question, so... And the neem tree that you spoke about, it's, is that the one that has a really tiny white pollen and beautiful smell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it produces small white flowers and they smell like, like jasmine and a mix of honey. Yeah, my neighbors. So would they be any good for mosquitoes? Because they're quite good at keeping insects away and our garden is mosquito ridden. So yeah. do I try planting? So you can try to plant the neem tree, though the main presence of the neem tree will not keep mosquitoes away. But my aunt takes the leaves of the uh, of the neem tree and burns them at the entrance of the house or windows. That smell it smells really bad. I know it's it just keeps the mosquitoes away. So other method also because once upon a time we had a very bad infestation of bed bugs, so we burned you know they were called bukhur. So we used to put the, so I used to put the neem leaves and burn them, and they would cover the blankets with the uh, so just so for that night at least the bed bugs are gone. So you could try burning those leaves. You dry them first, I guess, and then just burn them. Uh, my aunt just throws the leaves <laughs> and burns them. Okay. Oh. Yes. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting uh, talk. You, uh, you know a lot about the wildlife. Thing. I was just wondering about another invasive species yeah. um, that's been driving me nuts lately: crows. So <laughs> <laughs> <for> guessing. <laughs> I promise you that I had that question. I, I knew that question was coming. <laughs> so there are two. I have there are two two answers here. So I'll just keep them short for everyone. Uh, so I don't want to take everyone's time. Have I seen a predator attacking the crows other than feral cats? No, I have not seen. I have seen them being harassed though by uh, by the shikra. Never. I, I have never seen them being attacked by a predator. The other answer is that. 
I've had that idea. It's just that I want to hear it from someone else. Is that during lockdown, the price, the crows numbers have dwindled greatly. It's just because people are just littering everywhere. So when people are just stayed in their homes, nobody's littering. The crows had had to leave. There is no, and that's why they. Chiefs, yeah. Can I? Uh, can I? I know you don't want to spend a lot of time on crows, but it's interesting for me to know why they're driving. Why they're driving nuts? <laughs> <laughs> what they're doing? <laughs> 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 they have tiny kids, aren't they? They're tiny. Yeah. There's several that are around the Jumeirah Lake Towers. The crows, specific. Luckily, not me, but they have specific people they really hate and they die for. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to check with those people why are they being attacked? Only they can give you that answer because if you attempted to throw rocks at them, or maybe you shot if, if they see you shooting them, the moment they see your face, that's it because they will just inform other crows that this guy <laughs> they didn't do what's so much. Yeah. It's it isn't familiar to everybody. I think it's now pretty well established that most bird species, anyway, can recognize individual people, and they even even when research teams are out doing different things to them, the uh, uh, birds in a in a colony will recognize who is the bad guy who comes and handles the eggs and so on, and who are the good guys who just stand at a distance and take pictures. I wouldn't like them to come and use my garden or my tree as their nighttime tree. I wouldn't I wouldn't like that. And they do come into my garden and make a bit of a noise and drop things, but they don't drive me nuts. I don't personally mind them. And I'm interested because it's not the first meeting I've been to where someone's Complained about them. Yeah. Does everyone hate crows? They are stealing. Everyone <laughs> they can jump to your tables, eat your food. Yeah. They are really stealing from the table if you are sitting out there. Yeah, the beach clubs and oh, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Where I'm, where I'm living well, in the trade center, the palm, the palm doves oh, the have, lost, almost have lost the ability to fly. People come along and they just walk out of the way and they pop up on the tables and so on. They don't seem, though, as aggressive as crows. Uh, they yeah, maybe because of the color and the size. They feel, you know, maybe people are getting afraid a little bit because... Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, have I have seen seen changes? Crows are bad luck, you know? Yeah. I'm maybe we have that more I think yeah, yeah. 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 So we see changes, like, is there something in particular that you... Well, I, for, uh, an example that I was going to give is, is anybody that's, that's, that's been here uh, even since the early 90s uh, will see that the collared dove has expanded dramatically, mostly at the expense of the, the palm dove. I would have said, uh, but I'm not living out in New Dubai, uh, I would have said that I don't see nearly as many crows as I used to. They used to, uh, it, it, one of the big storm, storms that knocked down the big trees in the old Safa Park took out a lot of the crows. Uh, and of course, now that Safa Park is only half a park, uh, you don't see you don't see the crows there either. But maybe they maybe they went out to do Dubai. They, they moved yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. half a park, but yeah, the park was cut in half. So apparently there is only a certain amount of trees they can use. So definitely, I assume that it will be less. But they're still there. I went I go there every now and then. The other thing, do you, do, you, do you see the the white cheek? The, well, now it's white eared global continuing to spread at the expense at the uh, ex expense of anybody else. Or... The white eared global. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the white eared global. The only thing that I have that I have read is on this book, the Arabian Wildlife Encyclopedia. It may have displaced the white spectacled bulbul, which is the bulbul that's native to the Middle Wadis. Uh, but in my opinion, that as long as urbanization happens, it just follows along with it. That just provides it, it's just the changes that happen in that environment. 
the white haired bulbul favors that environment, the white spectacle bulbul doesn't. It will take time because I have found a pair of white spectacle bulbul in, in Dubai. It's, they're a pair, so I don't know if they're breeding or not, but I would, I would assume that they are. But are they displacing competitively? I, I don't think it's competition wise. I think they were just changing the environment in favor of the white haired bulbul. I hope it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm really just interested in patterns that people are are seeing and uh, changing. Some of them are easy to easy to explain. They are increasingly being more uh, because when when these crows are hunted, these areas they become the next target for the for the shika. So I, it will be easier. I mean, if I imagine it, the shikra would uh, would choose them over a sparrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're bigger and probably slower as well. So other than that, they other than that behavior where they're attacking the wasps, I have nothing so far. You you made you made some some comments that are controversial, and I know from from talking to you that uh, you've had some unhappy discussions on uh, on social media. When you say things like, for example, well. It, it's better for for animals and and the environment generally. It's better to have some plants, even non-native plants, than to have no plants. No doubt, you meet purists who say, "No, my God, if it if it's not native, it shouldn't be there." Yeah. Uh, can can you say a little more about some of the things people have challenged you? Challenged you? Okay. So people live in this. Uh, I don't want to be rude, but they live in this fantasy land. Where we can live solely and survive on nothing but half trees, acacias, cedar, excluding date palms because date palms need water, so we have to exclude them. So I told them, Are you going to eat libu for the rest for the rest of your life, or eat like a camel eating half leaves? And what are you going to eat? They say, Well, we'll figure that that out later. I say, Why don't you figure it, figure it out now, and then you can come with the answer, and then you can proceed with that. So, for so, so for example, I'm not against planting native trees, or and support of planting non natives. I'm just I'm just asking people to find the balance. There's there is no need to plant a forest of a native tree or or, uh, or a jungle of uh, non natives. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that if if you want a plant for a certain reason, if you want a fruit tree, how can you convince me to plant a rough tree because it is an alternative to a non native? It it doesn't make sense to me. I said. If you plant the neem tree, for example, in close proximity to the rough tree, they don't harm each other, but the presence of the neem leaves on the ground will, will reduce the amount of neem of the rough uh, legumes being infested by the weevils that eat their seeds. So I said, it's you find, you find both, uh, you find that balance. So I hope uh, I elaborated well enough. I mean, there, 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 there will always be purists, and there will always be people taking the short-term view. Sure, yeah. If if the man wants, for example, lots of peaches quickly, he'll plant he'll plant lots of peach plants. Exactly. Never, never, never mind whether in ten years he'll have a he'll have a successful orchard. Yeah, he just he just think about the moment now, and what happens later. Tomorrow's problems for tomorrow's me. Uh, one thing that was I uh, I struck me. When you were showing early pictures of the large trees on the lawn creating shade, is that they do create shade? But I had occasion to to spend time a couple of months ago at a, at a very large grassy property with trees, and it it I, I was then struck for the first time really that the conicarpus, the land landleaf buttonwood, yeah. uh, is allelopathic. Even the grass didn't want to grow well. Yeah. under it and the eucalyptus uh, notoriously does the same and yeah. so on um i i don't know i guess I, I i'm asking do you think it's a good idea to plant those for shade i guess if you really need if shade is what you want yeah you so that's yeah. so that's why what i said is that uh is that you see what you if you want to plant the button with dance leaf or the eucalyptus or the occasion that why do you want to plant them do you want them just to give you Secure because the, the, the land sleeve is just common as as like a barrier, as a cover for, for people's houses for security. 
uh, but if you want to grow good trees behind those trees, like the rough trees, mango trees will, will can grow well near the near uh, rough trees, but not well near the eucalyptus. So it's just why do you want those trees in the beginning, in the, in the first place? Uh, and then you can make your choice. My choice, if I have to choose a tree that is uh, a windbreaker and shades for other uh, plants, it will be the acacia, the Chilean lotica. Because it's going to be irrigated anyway, since I'm irrigating the other plants. Because once you plant it, it's not going to live like its wild counterparts parts because the, the root system will just change dramatically because it's, because the constant supply of water until it is established will be focused uh, will focus energy on sending the lateral roots and not sending a deep depth to, uh, to the uh, sorry this is this is what this is our our standard acacias or the or the mesquite thorn uh, this would apply this would apply to the acacia nilotica but I have noticed that any desert plant, that the only reason they are jobs on is that because they send that deep tap roots. If you give them irrigation, even the rough tree will just send lateral root system. If you go to public parks, you find the roots of the rough tree even growing, emerging from the from from the lawn even, because the tree knows that I have no need to go under for groundwater. There's water at the surface, and that also will make the roots even more aggressive. Yes. Uh, you mentioned. The squirrel, you got a photo there a bit. What about observations about rats and mice? So, brown rats and black rats and mice. Uh, that goes back to the non native uh, plants. There are those plants called the, uh, called the, it's called the Glorocidia, Glorocidia cpm. It's also called the mouse killer. That's what the Latin name means. You can use that, uh, the seeds of that plant as, as rat poison. So, what people used to do in Mexico, I remember, is that they would boil the leaves. And they would as well, uh, and they would pound it with rice or uh, or with uh, with wheat, and they would put it every in the corner of their uh, wheat storage, and the rats will be dead everywhere. So maybe that's a bit too extreme, but as for wildlife, I can only imagine the because I have seen the shikra as well here hunting uh, the hunting mice, though not rats. So as for rats, uh, other than the glorocidia, I have not. Uh, don't One have any information. Predators is that the, the these birds aren't out at night when the rats are are out. Right. So yes. what, what was the plant that you uh, used to kill rats? I want to know. The plant. Okay. Uh, it's called the Glyricidia. Glyricidia. G l i r i d i a. Glyricidia. You use the leaves. Uh, use the seeds. You can get the seeds. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there are some public parks have them and they're flowering at the moment. I think you should wait for two months, three months, and the seeds should be ready. Uh, I, used, I used to have seeds, but they're just for they're not enough to be used as to, to mask kill uh, rat colony. Yeah, does, but does it kill just rats or does it kill other mammals? Is it going to knock off these squirrels? I, I understand developers now are asking to have the squirrels put into their new developments. Oh, can I ask okay. about this squirrel? Well, so that they don't have an amenity. <laughs> when did they appear? Because when I first came to the UAE 15 years ago, I didn't see them. And the first time I saw them was with you oh, yeah. a year ago, only a year ago. Right. But they've been here for longer, it seems. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They've been here in some part of the you wouldn't see them. For a long time? I don't know about a long time. I'm near some part only for, for less than a year. But I the see the records were in the mid or early 2000s. Right. Uh, I think you could actually read about one of the first in the Gazelle. Really? They were seen in uh, Fujairah, uh, but then showed up soon after in, uh, in suburban Dubai. Now, I think we thought they were, they were protected pets. Actually, I am. Well, someone brought them. And deliberately introduced. I'm guilty. When I <laughs> I found them in, uh, I was maybe I was like eight or nine years old. So I told my grandma. So it was like a cartoon. I remember. So I told my grandma that I want a squirrel. She, she because we have no squirrels in the UAE. Yeah. The Arabic name for a squirrel is Sinjab. She's like, what is that? So we went to the pet store and she and to her that thing is not a squirrel, just a rat. But because she promised me, so we took a pair, and then I brought them to my house. And I thought this they're too cramped in their cage. I'll let them free because they seemed to get used to me. So I opened the cage and they're just everywhere. And they lived outdoors for a while. 
So did they come back? <laughs> they don't come to me, but they sit in the area. In the garden? In the area, yes. Yeah. We, know, we know who is responsible. <laughs> yeah. and when would that be? Can I ask what year would that be? Oh, uh, I was eight. Maybe I was, Maybe that was back in 1990. I was born in 1993. So, so other people, other Emiratis, yeah. for example, were, were doing the same thing? Oh, one, one million percent, yes. Yeah. yeah, one million percent. I can guarantee you. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I've observed here in Dubai a few uh, trees which have panels on them, the digitizing and protecting yeah. uh, perennial native trees. Are you seeing that uptake being uh, honored and respected? And do you see it growing to protect other natives? Uh, native I have, yeah. Okay, well, that cuts out of the bag. It cuts out of the bag. The answer is no, but you cannot stop a, a tree. Cannot stop millions worth project. You know, if I'm saying it correctly. But the trees you can find these trees that are being numbered. They are mostly the dab trees and the cedar, but I have also uh, noticed them on the banyan trees, uh, ficus bengalensis, because they do grow very large. Uh, so I have noticed them being uh, being numbered. Are they? Being pretty, yes, well, yes, they are protected, but if there's a project or uh, they're building a neighborhood in that area, it's not going to stop that tree from being relocated. I hope yeah. that there, there used to be many, many, uh, many, uh, maybe we're talking of uh, dozens uh, overall of really big uh, uh, banyan type uh, trees and, and ficus religiosa. In nearer to the center of Dubai, and they were the center. They were shade trees that people sat under, and so on. I think most of those have have died or or passed away for buildings. Are there people growing those on plantations or in private estates now that you know? Of? Oh yes, oh yes. There's this one mosque in Jumeirah, the Jumeirah Grand Mosque, I believe it's called. It's the opposite of Lamer. There's one huge banyan tree. That's one of the largest banyan trees in the UAE that I know of. I have seen large ones in Al Ain, but they were removed because they, they were growing in a roundabout. So that roundabout was removed. So I don't know what they did with those trees. They relocated them. Uh, hopefully. So in that Grand Mosque, you can find that in Jumeirah Grand Mosque, there's one large banyan tree. And yes, they are very common in urban landscapes, especially the followers of the Hindu faith, uh, because it's considered a holy or a sacred tree, uh, tree to them. In this area, you can find them, especially in Jumeirah, you can find large banyan trees there. There is couple in some of our as well. I don't know, but I think there are large, I think those are ficus religiosa, I think so. So other other than other than ficus religiosa and ficus bengalensis, there is ficus altissima, which is the large one. There's a large tree, I think it's this side or this side, where we can, where we, we enter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, that tree, that's called ficus altissima. It is one of the three trees that I told to talk to you about that, that grows on date palms and maybe can strangle them. Because they're like a type of strangler trees. Have these trees been planted deliberately by certain individuals? Yes. Because they're special? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are the area in, uh, in Sharjah called Arola. You know Arola in Sharjah? So that area was named after a banyan tree that used to live there. It was estimated to be 150 years old when it died. The branches traveled for 50 meters. It died, I believe, in the 70s. It, who would, who would you know who would have planted that? An, an, an Arab, a trader from India? And why, would, why would they put them? So, particularly in Sharjah and, and the Northern Emirates. Uh, I, I learned this when I first got here. I worked uh, for a time in, in Sharjah with older business people. Many of those had been, had been educated in India. Mm -hmm. And so they would have grown up as students and so on, sitting under these things there. And uh, I, I think it was just a habit that they brought, they brought with them, not just, well, not for agriculture, but for as as amenities, something something civilized people did. Just like how I brought weeping willows from Europe secretly. I just took the cutting and put them in the bag. Weeping willows. Yes. What did you bring? Weeping willows. Saplings. Uh, no, I just took the cuttings. Okay. I just. Uh... And did they grow? Oh yeah, yeah. And the roots are very bad. They I learned that the hard way. So. <laughs>
So yeah. So it's yeah, the same way people travel bring the plants with them. The banyan trees are all planted. That though yes, there are examples of them growing uh, naturally on their own. But that is only because they are dispersed by birds like the common miner and the white ears bulbul. If the bulbul is sitting on a palm tree when it uh, releases the, the seeds from its stomach, if the seed falls on the, the trunk of the date palm, because of all the crevices and the scratches on the, the trunk of the date palm, they can germinate. Over time, they may strangle the, large, the palm tree. I have not seen it, but you can find large sometimes uh, of them uh, growing on uh, palm trees. So, uh, someone raised their hands, I believe. Are you... Yes, yes. Well, there are two things. First of all, about the pros. I mean, if you go to a lot of the hotels, also the Dubai Offshore Sailing Club, they have falconers who visit the hotels on a regular basis to chase away the falcons and the miners mm -hmm. because they are a pest. And um, I've sent you a, a text. Um, there's a really good book, um, The Hidden Life of Trees which goes into the, you were talking about fungus, yeah, yeah. Trees, and yeah. that goes into quite a lot of detail. And yeah. if anybody's interested in how trees communicate, The Hidden Life of Trees by a, a German author is really a book worth reading. Yeah. Uh, in Pakistan, they use the shikra to, to actually hunt the same crows, to actually hunt them. But birds that are, but the birds of prey that are raised by people, they are more confident to attack larger prey because they know there's someone to help them. But I have seen them harassing the crows, like chasing them away from their trees, but never really hunting them. I have not seen them. They don't hunt them, they just chase. It's a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Chase. Yeah. yeah. So if it's hunting as a wild chicken, I have not seen it. Yes. I have this question. How much do you think the nature of the land is being defined, defined by bringing all this vegetation? I mean, I believe in kind of nature backlashing at you. Yeah. Uh, so much do you believe the nature of this land is accepting this invasion? Okay, so, are, so we're basically asking where do we draw the red line, basically? Yes, exactly. Okay. So one way of backlash would be the invasive species because the, uh, the mesquite was actually introduced. I don't know by who, but uh, it was introduced for forestation and for uh, shade and as fodder for the animals. That's one way plants can backlash. But in areas like in the UAE, because think of it as think of it as a new country that's uh, establishing today, you're going to need companies to come from abroad for your economy and so on and so forth. Each company that comes will need to hire uh, IT experts, HR, and so on and so forth. Every tree will open that kind of niche. So, for example, say, uh, say the neem tree, for example. Think of it as a company, but then it needs people to function, for it to function. So it will need pollinators. It will need seed, birds that disperse the seeds. So chances are, when you bring birds as pets and you release them or squirrels, if they escape, chances are they may find a suitable plant for them that will help them to, to establish themselves. That's, I think, the only way they can, uh, as a backlash, but... To me, I don't. I recommend a book written by uh, by, a, by a British professor. His name is Chris Thomas. He's, in, he's the the author of a book, uh, Inheritors of the Earth. And there's also there's another one also. His name is Ken Thompson. His his, his book title is uh, Where Do Candles Belong? So so the, these people basically what they're saying is that nature doesn't care. If something becomes invasive, because every plant on this earth today in its habitat must have been invasive at one point. Even the Khatsh might have been invasive in the UAE at one point, but people did not care. But I do not see that mesquite be taking that Ghatsh tree's place. I just can't see it. What about climate change? How do you think it might affect the balance globally and... Well, plants are shifting. Because then uh, Chris Thomas, for example, he actually did say that, that, uh, that Europe should open its borders for plants. The open border for plants, because just animals and plants will just be, will be moving forward, uh, upward, sorry, north, because it's just getting hotter uh, in the south. And it's getting more milder in, in Europe. Um, so uh, Gary Spooner even raised, Spooner? Yeah. raised a point with uh, a dragonfly that is not native to Europe, but because Europe is having warmer winters, 
this start to slowly spread throughout uh, South Europe. So, so I personally don't know where to draw the red line here. So yes, I do give, I do, I do agree that you have to give the priority to the native uh, to the native plants. But then, if other plants can give you what you need, why not? But of course, you have to give the environment in uh, the environment uh, the right to. Thank you. To have a word. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ahmed. I'm going to take you formally. I'm sorry, I'm speaking partly with a microphone. I'm, I'm going, to, going to take you formally off the, the stage. People may have questions uh, afterward. Thank you very much for uh, 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 this presentation, uh, which was very practic practical oriented and systemic oriented. And I think many of us will look differently at our, our backyard and park and garden trees and birds uh, after hearing you uh, uh, speak. So thank you very much for that. We're going to leave you with uh, two things uh, tonight. One, uh, uh, as we do with all our speakers, we'll, we're going to give you a, a complimentary DNHG membership so you'll get our newsletters and so on. And number two, uh, we uh, we have a book for you, except from something you said, uh, we may have to we may have to make another uh, choice. Uh, you may have <laughs> Uh, do you have a copy of this already? I had give you one a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll have we'll have to give you another one, which we don't have with us uh, Thank you this, this evening. We'll let you choose one. Thank you very much. Thank I look you. forward to seeing uh, all of you. I always have to stop and think what month it is. Look forward to seeing you in in March on the first Monday of March, which I think is the fourth, but not so long from now. And John John Burke is going to give us what I think will be a miscellany of interesting uh, facts from different fields about the uh, uh, Emirates Natural History, a celebration of the natural history of the, uh, the Emirates. Thank you very much. Thank you.